So I thought it appropriate to just speak a bit on mothers. Is that all right? Let's uh, bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our mothers. We thank you for the courage and the strength that they have given and that they have invested for us. And I pray now as I speak that you would guide my lips so that your word would come through in Jesus' name. Amen. So a mother's worth, the importance of a good mother. Now, motherhood is a noble calling, and so is getting, it's not for the faint of heart, right? Now, the thing is about parenting is, unfortunately, there is no manual. <laughs> there is no test that you have to take before you're allowed to have children, Right? Uh, you know, if we're talking about nursing or talking about being a doctor, talking about being even an engineer and stuff like that, you got to pass courses, you got to pass exams. You don't have to do that when it comes to being a mother. But that doesn't change the fact that it requires all of you, right? Especially in the context of what we're talking about here good mother. Because not every mother's a good mother, right? And of course, I, here, when I'm talking about motherhood, I don't want it to, to, for you guys to get hard on yourselves, for those of you mothers here, in that I'm not here to criticize or put down, because I do believe that the vast majority of us do the best we can with what we were given. Amen? And uh, that's something that I had to come to appreciate with time, because it's so easy to hold on to uh, hurts or bitternesses of things that our mothers didn't do or did to us that hurt us. But it's important for us first to start from that, from that stand, from that place, right? Every one of you mothers here, I believe, had, have done the best that you know how, are doing the best you know how. And so let's start from that foundation, amen? And to do it well, to, whether you're talking about being a father or a mother, but especially as a mother, to do it well will require everything you have and then some. It'll push you to the limit, right? It'll push you past the limit. <laughs> and when you get pushed past the limit, that's where you really find out where you're at, especially when it comes to your relationship with God. Amen? Amen. I heard it said somewhere that you will find out what the true test of a person is the true person they are in the midst of crisis. And that's the thing for every of us, uh, one of us, right? When we find ourselves in really hard and difficult and stressful places, we'll really find out whether or not we believe what we preach, especially for Christians. Now, the gold standard for mothers and for women in general is Proverbs 31. And uh, just, I'm not going to read the whole Proverbs, but just this part here, which I think has to do with mothers. It says, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised." So we cannot overstate, I certainly cannot overstate the importance of a good mother in a home. You just think about this. We've got to, as parents, think about the end goal. What's the end goal with our children? I think that the ultimate end goal is salvation, right? Because if we get to heaven and our children aren't there, we're all going to have regret. And so that should be the ultimate goal. Of course, going back to that, we want our children not to be living with us when they're 50. Amen? <laughs> Can I get some amens here? Come on, right? <laughs> we might live with them when they're 50, but that's a different situation. <laughs> that's the end of life care, right? <laughs> So we want to see our children launch successfully into the world to find their own way to become successful, whatever it is that they are set to do, right? It's important for that. But of course, for them to be able to do that in the world, they've got to have a safe place at home. 
They've got to be. I mean, as a mother, you have to be the cheerleader of your children. You have to speak truth into your children. Too often, we will speak into our children our doubts, our fears, our hurts. And you know what ends up happening is we will reap what we sow, right? And so if we want good from our children, we must praise good, even when the good may not even be there. Too often... Well-meaning mothers in the moment have said things that have marked their children. And their children carry it around like a weight, like a ball and chain everywhere they go. And those are things that can't 100% be corrected, but I would submit to you, even if your children are adults right now, you can still speak good and you can acknowledge the wrong that you've done because that matters, right? It matters for us. If we're going to be men and women of character, and especially in the context of motherhood, if you're going to be a woman of character, you must be willing to admit that you make mistakes. You must be willing to apologize for those mistakes. You must be willing to make amends as much as you can for those mistakes. Because what is that called? That's called humility. And humility is a characteristic of God and a characteristic of Christ in us. And it's important because if our children see us admitting our faults, then guess what they learn to do with others? They admit their faults with others because they understand that that is safe to do. Ellen White has much to say about mothers, especially in Adventist home. I'll just take a uh, There's just this one quote in, uh, page, in chapter 38 where she has this to say. She says, The queen of the home, the king upon his throne, has no higher work then has the mother. The mother is queen of her household. She has in her power the molding of her children's characters that they may be fitted for the higher immortal life. An angel could not ask for a higher service, for in doing this work she is doing service for God. Let her, o- let her only realize the high character of her task, and it will inspire her with courage. Let her realize the worth of her work and put on the whole armor of God that she may resist the temptation to to conform to the world's standards. Her work is for time and for eternity. These are wise words. Here's a major area where motherhood as a Christian is very different than what the world is telling us. What the world tells us is, women, grab your opportunity by the horns, make the best of it, go get your career, go make your life and build yourself up and enjoy it and have a happy time and a good time and make a good wage and show those men, right, that, that you're just as good and better than they are. That's what the world is selling. That's the Kool-Aid, if you will, the, the spite Kool-Aid that they are selling. You know what the difference is for us as Christians? Is that we are, don't have our eyes just on this world. We don't have our eyes fixed on the glory of this world. If that's where we look, we're going to get disappointed. And if we look there as mothers or as fathers, I would submit, if that's where our goal is, we're going to sell our children short. Because really, compared, just imagine what it's going to be like to be among the redeemed and your children are not there. There'll be a lot of tears in heaven. Now, your children will copy your spiritual habits. Our children are recording machines, especially when they're young, right? Everything they see you do, they're going to do. Everything you say, they're going to say. Everywhere you go, they're going to they're gonna go. And so if you think about this, if we were to evaluate how we say it and what we do and where we go, then we ask ourselves, well... Oftentimes, as parents, we tell them, don't do what I'm doing. Do what I say. But here's the truth. We all have fallen, sinful human natures. You don't have to to teach your child to steal. Did you know that? You don't have to. Of course, they can learn it from you, too. Don't get me wrong. And they can become accomplished at it in a bad way. But they don't need to learn that, usually, because it's in our natures. Lying. Stealing. Being mean to others, hitting others. These are all things that come in our natural natures. What doesn't come naturally is looking to God, is having a relationship with God. It's looking with the eyes of faith to what is coming and what is better and what is best. Looking to eternity. These things don't happen naturally. 
They must be taught. And that's what I believe when the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's a promise that if you train your children to fear the Lord, they're far more likely to fear the Lord. Now, let me just, again, give a disclaimer here, and that is that every human being is a free person to make their own choices. And even Adam and Eve raised Cain. Amen? And Cain didn't turn out the way that Adam and Eve would have wanted to. So you can do everything right. You can raise your children right, and they can still turn out to be Cain. So I'm not trying to, to tell you that you can, and we obviously also can't turn back the clock. I'm sure Adam and Eve racked their brains thinking, where did we go wrong? Right? Where did we go wrong? How did we get here? But the reality is, is Adam and Eve did that to God, didn't they? Right? The very thing Cain did, they did to God. And so they had an object lesson right there in that first generation. So... In that sense, I want to encourage you, mothers, to be kind to yourselves. Sometimes the person that we will not forgive is ourselves. Does that make sense? We need to learn to be able to will, willing to forgive ourselves. This again comes back to making amends. Now, one of the best scriptures to guide us as parents, I believe, is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Gentlemen, can you move the slide for it? it? Says We read here in verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall, what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand, and they shall be as frontlets before, between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So how often are we to teach our children about God? Always, everywhere. When we get up, when we go down, when we're going around Everything that we're doing, we're talking and we're expressing. You've got to also learn. It's so easy for us to complain. What we also need to start doing is blessing. This is one of the things you, you may have heard, you may or may not have heard me say before, but a lot of times in our culture, we have this expression, oh, I was so lucky. I was so lucky to get this parking spot. I was so lucky to get an extra, you know, an extra um, uh, refund on my, on my tax check. I was so lucky for this or for that. We as Christians need to take luck out of the picture, all right? We need to give glory to God when God gives us blessings, amen? And so when something good happens to you, we need to change how we talk. We need to say, God blessed us with this. God blessed me with this. God is so good to us. God is so wonderful to us. Isn't it great that God did this right now? Oh, isn't it wonderful that God created the stars? How many of you saw the northern lights? Yeah, a few of you did. There were beautiful northern lights. I didn't see them either, but I saw pictures. <laughs> Apparently, they were especially good in St. Joe's Island is what I hear. So you missed out, right? But here's the thing, right? When we see the north, something like the northern lights, that's the beauty of God, right? We're going camping and we enjoy nature. That's the beauty of God. We've had wonderful weather lately, right? That is not luck. That is the grace and, and beauty and blessing of God. And you see, if we learn to give God the glory for all of the good that comes our way, then that teaches our children to give glory to God. Does that make sense? And the children are far more likely later to do the same because they've been taught to do it. The decline of the family has directly led to the decline of Christianity. There's a book on the West studying, a detailed study on the Western decline of Christianity. And it's correlated almost exactly with the decline of the nuclear family. As the family has broken up, as the family has started, the more single parent homes that we have, the more divorce that we have, people, children that are raised in broken homes and single parent homes are far more likely to abandon Christianity than children that are raised in a whole family. And if you think about it, it makes sense because divorce is painful. 
right? Not having another to both spouses and the balance that comes from a, a husband and a wife and the family is difficult and painful. And those things end up causing children to grow up not having as much interest in God, which I believe puts uh, the onus on us to be the best parents we have, but also when it comes to our relationship with our spouse, we need to really make sure we invest in it as well, because if the family breaks up, the children lose big time. Now, notice that that verse that we just read started with loving God with all our hearts, right? You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. The first thing is we need to love God first, then you love your husband or your wife, and last but not least, you love your children. And I would submit to you it should be in that order. It should be in that order, and that's going to be tough, especially as you're, some of you, your children are super young, and you are really tired, and they are running you ragged sometimes, but your spouse has to come before your children. Now, I don't mean neglect your children. They need to be fed, and they need to be cared for. What I mean by that is you've got to make time for each other. If you, these things don't happen by accident. Time and a couple don't happen by accident. It's because it's a priority. It gets done. Whatever's important to you gets done. And this is the thing. It's this, especially when it comes to, to our love for God. Devotional time doesn't happen by accident. Prayer doesn't happen by accident. It happens because I value it. Because I prioritize it. And oftentimes when we're burned out and we're run ragged and I'm as guilty as anyone, it's easy to turn on the TV and to turn your brain off. But those kinds of things aren't going to help you. They're not going to truly recharge you. All they do is they shut you, they numb you, right? They shut your brain off for a while, they numb you. But the only one who's going to give you the strength to carry on is, is God, right? Is, is connecting with God. And then if you have a good relationship with your spouse, then you're a unit. You're much stronger as a unit than as an individual. And today, fortunately, we, we have men far more involved in child railing than they used to be. I don't know if my father ever changed a diaper, as an example. I know for myself that I was, I was actively involved with, that as, with my children. I know, I, I believe, most of you men here who are married, right, Nep? You guys are helping out in the home to lighten the load, right? And we work together as a team. Mother Teresa says this, It's easy to love the people far away. It's not always easy to love those close to us. Bring love into your home for there. This is where our love for each other must start. Thing is, is again here, it's about consistency. Who you are in closed doors, your children see everything. They hear everything. So if you're coming to church, for instance, and when you get to church, you say, Oh, it's so good to see you. I'm so happy to see you. I'm so glad to be here. And then when you get into the car, you go, What were you doing there? Or did you see so-and-so doing this or doing that? That pastor, I wish he had ended his sermon earlier because I'm hungry, I need to eat, whatever it is. When you criticize like that and look for the faults of others, then your children will remember that and be impacted by that far more than any of the spiritual teaching they received today. It is far, far easier to reinforce the negative and to reinforce the the you know, the darkness in us, the sin in us, the brokenness in us, then it is God. I also promise you that if the only time this children are, your children are getting spiritual instruction is during church, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You remember what we read in Deuteronomy? When you rise up, when you go down, that's like morning worship, evening worship, right? It's like when you're walking, when you're spending time together, you're talking about God and you're pointing them to God. It's all the time. You can't rely on the church. And we know we can't rely on school. Right? Certainly not public school. So being a good mother is hard work and requires huge sacrifices. And I want to just be here to tell you, all of you mothers, including my own mother who's watching online, thank you for the sacrifices that you have made. Thank you for the countless sleepless nights. For the countless having to clean up vomit. And... <laughs> and poo, and, and all the other nastiness of, of just being so deep sleep deprived that you're like, you're right at the edge of, of sanity, and yet you are still putting your own needs aside in order to take care of your children. Thank you for that. 
And thank you for putting God first, because really, that's what you are going to remember for eternity. For eternity, the investment that you place in your children will either be a source of blessing or a source of sadness. Now, thankfully, Revelation 21.4 tells us that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, so we will be able to mourn the loss, but guess how long that mourning might happen? According to Scripture, it could be a thousand years. How many of you want to cry for a thousand years for your lost children? Regret, right? Weighs tons. We also need to remember in a family that Leviticus 19.18 says, if I can get back to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This starts again in the home, right? Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. The people closest to you know you best. Who you are with your family behind closed doors is who you actually are. Does that make sense? Let's not make any excuses. Let's not sugarcoat things, right? The person you are when no one else but your family is looking, that's who you are. And so if you like what you see, then praise God. Give God the glory. But if you don't, then God can help you change. And I encourage you, by God's grace, to change, to become like Jesus, so that God would get the glory and your children would come to see that it's actually faith in Jesus and, and being part of a church is actually a good thing. Do you know that's another thing we need to confess to our children? If you say to them, oh, here, we have to go to church again. Oh, I've got to get dressed again. Oh, I've got to dress all the kids again. It's too much. Oh, I don't know what to bring to church. I hate doing potluck because I can't, I, you know, I hate cooking, right? Oh, so-and-so in church is, is driving me nuts and crazy. What am I going to do? When you have those kinds of conversations, which all of us have had, if we're honest, okay, those things multiplied by years and years and years of exposure. You know what the kids learn? Church is a chore. Church is drudgery. Church is unpleasant. Church is a necessary evil. God is a chore. God is drudgery. I'm afraid to burn, and so because I want fire insurance, I'll be nice to God, but really... <laughs> If we're honest, right? Look, let's just be honest here. <laughs> if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then you're going to have the joy of the Lord. How many here are joyful right now? Amen. Yeah, joy is a choice. We make the choice to be joyful, right? And if we have joy and we express that joy, often our children will hear that joy. And then guess what? They'll want to come to church. And they'll look forward to church. And especially if, if the parents are happy at church and have joy in the church, it's much more likely that they too will want to have that. And by the way, that's something that we all need to do. I know I didn't do it nearly as much as I should have. We need as parents to be able to tell our children how much church is valuable to us, how much Jesus means to us, how much we need Jesus, and how close he is to us and what a good friend he is to us. If we're not expressing those things, we can't expect our children to read our minds, and instead, they'll, all they'll hear is all of the negative. Does that make sense? I've already said this. Everything you say, everything you do is recorded for future use. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, here's the thing. We can be so focused on saving other people, and we lose our own children. We lose our own family. And so the first disciples that we have as parents, as mothers, the first disciples you have as fathers, the first disciples you have as your own children. And we need to talk to them. We need to teach them to observe the commandments, and we need to observe them too. And when we do that, and we baptize, we can see them baptize, we can see them having their own relationship with the Lord. The beauty of it is we're going to be able to spend eternity with them. How wonderful is that going to be? Amen? Amen. What, right? What will heaven be like with your children 
without your children being there with you. I can, I can tell you, you know, that I have my children, a couple of my children that, that are struggling in their faith, and it's hard on me as a parent. And I have to trust that God is working in their hearts and their lives, but it's hard. And, um, and this is the thing for us. If your children are very young, you still have the opportunity to prioritize that. Because as the moral foundation, I mean, any of you know what age the moral foundation of a child is pretty much set? Seven years old. By the age of seven, the moral foundation of a child is set. And so for those of you who have children under seven, you still have time to set that foundation. That doesn't mean there isn't hope for the rest of us. Amen? Amen. <laughs> God can transform a life. God can change a direction. God can change our likes and our dislikes. He can give us a moral foundation even if we had a bad one. Right? Praise the Lord for that. But... But we need to take advantage of the opportunities we have and not waste them. Revelation 21.4, I already read that. Well, I, I referred to it anyway. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain for the former things have passed away. This happens after the thousand years. So we have a thousand years in the millennium to go over the books to figure out why it is that our loved ones are not with us. And for a thousand years we will mourn. Now, I'm not suggesting that for everyone we'll mourn for the whole thousand years, but I would imagine that for most of us, because our children are so precious to us, that most of us it'll take a thousand years to get over our children's loss. And so if you can just have that in your mind, you realize what is more important than that. Now, here's some practical advice. If the clicker will work for me. Spend time daily with God personally. You will never be able to move your children higher than you are with God. Especially when they're young. Have regular family worship. Family worship is important. Singing the songs, doing things that are appropriate at their age, reading something that's appropriate. It doesn't necessarily have to take long, but just the act of stopping and doing it is important. Same thing when it comes to meals. Just having grace at meals shows a signal. Even for my, for my kids, my oldest and my youngest that are pretty much very struggling in their faith, they both still bow their heads and close their eyes when we pray for our meals. Because <laughs> they understand that when they come to be with me, that's what we do. And so we want to be able to instill those kinds of values into our children. Be careful what your children hear, read, and watch. And here's something that is important today. It is been, it, today is the hardest for parents that it's ever been. It is harder now than it's ever been. Why do I mean that? Is because today you can take an iPad, an iPhone, you can stick it in front of your child and they will magically become mute. You can have the craziest Tasmanian devil of a child, right? Who's literally tearing the whole house apart and hanging and swinging from the chandeliers. And if you go and give them an iPad or an iPhone, they will sit there for hours glued to this thing. And for a stressed out, overworked, end of the rope parent, and especially mother, it can seem like a godsend. But it isn't a godsend. It's a portal of, most times it's a portal of evil. If, unless you are very careful with it. When I was a kid, right, kids were outside playing and doing things, right? Sports and, and other things and, and park and all kinds of things. Because, you know, I was, I was 10 years old when video game machines came out. But they were pretty primitive back then, right? If, if any of you were to see it. Like my kids, I, I would show them the Commodore 64 games I played and stuff like that. And there's these little stick men. Right? And they're nostalgic for me. But my kids are like, what did you ever see with it? This is so boring compared to all the games that they have today. Right? But the point is, is, is that those things draw attention and they grab the kids. And guess what? Every movie has a spiritual message. Every TV program has a moral message. Every one of them. The media, 
The news has a moral message. YouTube is passing a moral message. And most of the time, 99% of it is contrary to what the Bible teaches. And so if the children are consuming media in large, on large amounts, yes, they're staying quiet right now, but they're literally being plugged in. It's like taking a wire and plugging your children into the internet and just having the stuff getting downloaded in their brain. And then, then we're wondering, why are my children not interested in God and interested in church? That's one of the reasons. And here's the, where the sacrifice comes in. Even though you're at the end of your rope and it would be easier to have them turn the brain off and give them that device, don't. Just don't do it. And by the way, that also applies for us too. We should not be watching a lot of this stuff. We think it doesn't have an impact, but it does. Philippians 4, 8. We read here, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I'll just give you a, a little bit of a warning. My son, you know, a number of months or maybe a year ago or a year, two years ago, referenced the fact that he was watching. We, we had these, um, uh, the planet, you know, BBC uh, documentary which was all about nature stuff, right? But those nature shows are almost always talking about evolution and millions of years and this and that and this evolution and that. Well, those messages had an impact on his brain in terms of the way he looked at things and the curiosity that he had with evolution. And so here's something that you are wanting to give them. The intention for us is to give them nature, but these programs are usually not giving glory to God for their nature. They're giving glory to man-made philosophies, and those things have an impact. They mold, they shape children. And so don't, even though we, we need more, actually, nature stuff that's glorifying God. There's not enough being produced in those kinds of things because nature truly is wonderful, and it truly can lead us to God. But we need it cut out of this mumbo-jumbo nonsense of millions of years and, and everything happening by accident. Amen? Amen? And then, I encourage you to guard your relationship with your spouse and treat each other with love and respect. So that means how we speak to each other matters. Because you're teaching your child how to treat their future spouse. And so, if you're not treating each other well, if you're not resolving your conflict... If you're not working through your issues, if you're not prioritizing time with each other, if you're not showing what it looks like to be an adult, right, put on big boy and big girl pants, right, and work through our issues, then they too will do the same because they will just do whatever we did. And there's where Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be, their own hus with, the wives be to their own husbands in everything. But then that doesn't let the men off the hook. It says, husbands, love your wives just as what? Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. How much did Christ give? Everything says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to him, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So both work together. There could only be one spiritual leader in the home, and that should be the husband. All right. Now, sometimes the husbands aren't doing their thing. And so if there's a vacuum, the wife is going to have to step in and do it because you can't just not do anything because that's just spiritual suicide. But you men that are listening, you guys need to step up and take the leadership of the home and make a point of making sure that the spirituality of the home is taken care of. Uh, Ellen White has this to say again in chapter uh, 38 says, sculpturing a likeness of the divine. There's a God above, and the light and glory from his throne rests upon the faithful mother as she tries to ed educate her children to resist the influence of evil. No other work can equal hers in importance. She has not, like the artist, 
to paint a form of beauty upon canvas, nor like the sculptor to chisel it from marvel, marble. Sorry, She has not, like the author, to embody a noble thought in words of power, nor like the musician to express a beautiful sentiment and melody. It is hers, with the help of God, to develop in a human soul the likeness of the divine. The mother who appreciates this will regard her opportunities as priceless. Earnestly will she seek in her own character and by her methods of training to present before her children the highest ideal. Earnestly, patiently, courageously, she will endeavor to improve her own abilities that she might, may use aright the highest powers of the mind in training of her children. Earnestly will she inquire at every step, what hath God spoken? Diligently she will study his word. She will keep his, her eyes fixed upon Christ that her own daily experience in the lowly round of care and duty may be a true reflection of the one true life. And so here's the thing. The world is telling us that to go out and, and make something of yourself, but truly what we bring, the only thing we can bring to heaven is other souls. And this is true for all of us here, by the way. For men, sometimes we invest so much in our careers and our jobs and stuff like that, and we neglect our family as well, right? And in the process, we may do really well at work, but what's the eternal result of our work? Oftentimes, there is none. There is none. And so for all of us, let us recognize that we need to put God first in all things because that has fruit for eternity. That lasts for eternity. So family first is a good principle to have. Yes, you invest in family. The family will yield for you eternal blessings. For eternity, we can praise God together as a family. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that what we all want? Right? That requires for us now to do the hard thing and in make the priority and make the investment and put that emphasis where it needs to be. Now, everyone makes mistakes. Everyone. I'm gonna repeat after me. Everyone makes mistakes. Every one of us here has made mistakes. And we need to be kind to ourselves. We need to be kind to ourselves. We need to forgive ourselves for the mistakes we've made in the past. We can't control what happened in the past. It's gone. It's past. What we can control is the now. And by the way, for some of you, your children are long out of the home and grown up, but you have grandchildren. And so as grandchildren, you have an opportunity to invest in them, hopefully, if you've maintained a decent relationship with your children, that is, right? And so then you can invest. But even if you can't, for some reason, some of you may not even be able to see your grandkids because of issues of your family, or maybe you don't get along with your kids, but you know what you can do? You can pray. You can pray. And don't dismiss that as not a, a small thing. It's a big thing. You can be there to put prayer cover over your children. This is true while you have your kids. It's also true of your grandkids. And it's true once the kids are gone and out of the house and the grandkids are not around. Or maybe they live in another place far away. You can pray for them. And you don't know what will happen. I, I can tell you, you know, Brenda, right? <clears throat> Brenda, Curtis, uh, Tammy, all of them are in the process of, of studying. Or in Brenda's case, have already been baptized their mother was a praying mother. And the desire of her heart was to see her children come to faith. And here she is. Unfortunately, she passed on. But guess what God is doing? He's still answering the prayer of the faithful mother. Amen. Right? Amen. And so let us all recognize, first of all, God is good. God loves your children more than you love them. Be faithful. Hold on to him. Get, don't let him go. Trust in God. And even if it may not happen in your lifetime, as long as your children have breath, as long as God is on the throne, as long as Jesus hasn't come back, there's still hope. Amen? Amen. So forgive yourself and uh, cling to Jesus. Seek God with all your heart and ask daily for his help. And he will help you. God will grant you the greatest gift that any mother can receive which is the eternal salvation for children. You think about Mother's Day. What gift can you give on Mother's Day? Some of you are going to go out to eat, right? Some of you are going to get beautiful flowers. Some of you are going to get maybe even expensive gifts. But what the gift that is most valuable, the gift that is eternal, 
is the salvation of our children. Amen? And what if you didn't have a good mother? I just want to say this before we wrap up. Some of you didn't have a good mother. Well, I would suggest to you that by God's grace, become the mother you never had. Become the mother you never had. Now, that's also where church can come in because there are some good godly mothers, older women who have had experience. This is why connecting with each other, you can learn what good person looks like, what a mother can look like. It may not have been your mother, but you can learn how to be a good mother. And For those of you who have learned from your mistakes, you can pass that on to younger women so that they can learn from their mistakes. But it's never too late to learn. And just because you didn't have a good mother doesn't doom you to be a bad mother. Amen? I know my wife testifies to me many times about her mother, how she grew up as an orphan, and she lived with her, her, uh, her aunt, and the aunt basically had her doing just menial tasks, almost like a servant in the house, and yet she grew up with a gentle heart, with a love for her Lord, with a prayerful heart, and the impact that it had on my wife and on her, on her uh, sisters was, is still being felt today. And uh, I can tell you that she is a prayerful woman. That's the thing that my, my wife oftentimes when she's frustrated, does, she's almost sometimes reluctant to go to her mother to say something because she knows exactly what her mother's going to say, right? Which is what? Pray. <laughs> Pray. And her mother prays without ceasing. And that's a wonderful gift that we can give. So it doesn't matter if you've had a rough out, outcome, a rough life, an absent mother, a bad mother, an orphan. I don't care what circumstance or situation you came in. God can change us. God can teach us. God can use us to be better. Amen? Let's, um, I just invite you, I challenge each of us to do more to show Jesus to others. And if we will do that, if we will spend that, that, that takes a commitment. If we will do that, then we will reap the results for eternity. Amen?